Hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sicola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. Today, my guest is Paul Eisenberg, co-founder and CEO of Bringing Hope Home. He's also a business leader who strives to plug in his passion every day to make life better for others. Paul, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Laura. I appreciate it. Now, before we start, give me one quick, and we're, we're all sitting here at home. We're on Zoom, of course, because this is the podcast, but everybody nowadays is on some form of video conferencing, video communication because of our social distancing, as it were. But despite the challenges that that creates, sometimes there are silver linings to be found in these things. So let's, let's be optimistic on this. Share with us what's one silver lining that you've experienced. I've experienced a lot. The one main one that really stands out is I have time to think about my business as opposed to just be in full activity mode all the time. We are taking time as not only as individuals at our business, but also at bringing hope home or me personally. And as an organization, are we doing things the right way? Why are we doing things this way? Why can we do it better? How can we do it better? And it's really been valuable. It's been refreshing. Uh, I wish this time wasn't going on the way that it is. And as we talked earlier, people aren't suffering. But the silver lining that you asked for is we have time to think about our business as opposed to running it every day. And I'm going to pause for one second, Mario, just because I realize I don't have my earpiece plugged in and I can see that it's coming through in the audio. So give me one second. Sorry, Paul. It's okay. <laughs> Way too much equipment here. Is this in your house, I guess? Or is it over here? Please and then, Mario, I just want you to confirm with me that my sound did not change. Okay, so far, so good. Make sure my zoom is there. Still sounds great. Okay, good. Of course, it's going to look weird now that I suddenly have this earpiece in. <laughs> Modern <laughs> technology. Watch the video. All right. Poof. Magic. The company, they knew you needed it, so it grew right out of your head. Yes. Just magically manifested. <laughs> All right. On that note, let's, uh, we'll pick back up. Paul, I couldn't agree more. Now, tell everybody out there who's not familiar with bringing hope home. What is it? Where did it come from? What's it about? Bring Hope Home is a nonprofit, a 501c3 that uh, I founded with a friend of mine, Tim Sherry, after losing my late wife, Nicole. We were, uh, she lost her battle over six and a half years to stage four Hodgkin's disease. And, and during that time, we realized how lucky we were in, in, in trying to be faithful and optimistic. And we had a lot of good people helping to take care of us and a lot of great family. And in Nicole's travels through different health systems over the six and a half years, we realized that a lot of people don't have anybody they were struggling to pay bills or they were trying to pick between paying for the heating bill or paying for the food bill. And Nicole, who was very loving, couldn't fathom that. And uh, I've always spent a lot of time on my network and, and growing my network and utilizing and helping my network. And she said, well, you got to start helping people. And that's really how we started. And you're a set, you were originally in sales for 20 something years, fortune yeah. 500 companies. Yeah. I have, a, I have a sales career background, always been in sales for several different kinds of organizations and several different kinds of industries. Um, but I will tell you that the, what I do today is really no different than what I've ever done. It's just trying to line up people that maybe connect with what you do and who you are, how you do things and seeing if there's an opportunity to work together. So you're working with helping people whose families are in need because of health challenges yeah. to help them pay those bills. Yeah, we provide emotional financial support to local families with cancer. We've now helped over um, 6,000 families since we started in uh, 08. We pay household necessity bills and then help the family in a variety of different ways just to let them know they're not alone. That's so beautiful and it's so critical. And it's one of those things that you don't even think about existing until suddenly you need it. Yeah. God forbid you, if you get diagnosed with cancer, even with healthcare coverage, you're out of pocket can be 10, 20, 30 grand a year. 
which is we just try to get we just try to help those families any way we can and we don't we don't help patients we help families those families belong to us and we care about them as best we can like they're our own that's that's i thank you at that point because i don't think there's anybody out there who doesn't know someone who's been affected by cancer in one way shape or form yeah now you've mentioned that uh, in passing a moment ago that your past jobs in sales is in some ways not different from what you do now, but I'm sure there is some difference in some ways. You're obviously not trying to sell a, a product necessarily. Right. So when it comes to influence, you're now the founder of this organization as opposed, as opposed to a sales representative or a sales executive from a different company. So who do you need to influence in your current leadership role and, and how is that different from past experiences? Well, in past experiences, I was responsible for myself and motivating myself and taking care of business myself. Uh, now I have a team. We're a team of about 10 individuals. So my, my, part of my job is to make sure my team's on board, to make sure my team is motivated, make sure that we're all working in the right direction to achieve our goals. I also have to work with our board. I report to a board of directors and I, re, I work with them to make sure we're leveraging them the right way to make sure they're having the kind of impact they wanna have we're, and then we're leveraging or managing donors corporately, individually, through foundations, at schools. I mean, our donors range from little kids to very senior executives. So I, I would probably, not probably, I ask everybody for money one way or another. So everybody I come in contact with, it's important that we're trying to understand the best connection for them to be a mm-hmm. part of us. And that's a, you, part of my, my world in training and coaching is all about mastering the three C's. And that was number two. The three C's are the ability to command the room, connect with the audience and close the deal. And you just said right there, number two is, is your core essence, the ability to connect with people. That's so important. It's, and I really love that. I love that. I enjoy that. I'm really comfortable in that. And it's exciting for us as an organization to just connect with different kinds of people. So in order to do that, then what specific communication skills did you have to develop? Well, in in prepping for this, um, I was reading your questions and and it's really fascinating. You really got me thinking. Um, I've always been a, try to be a really transparent person, but I've become much more upfront. I used to as a lot of people in communication, sometimes you're not comfortable for what you're communicating about, whether you have to ask for the order, whether you have to ask somebody to do something, whether they're going to ask you, there's some discomfort in there. And and the one thing that's really worked for me, and and I remember the day it happened, I was having lunch with somebody and the person was very busy person. And the person said to me, just tell me what you want. I said, Oh, okay. I said, I want all your money. And this person (laughs) kind of chuckled like that. And I said, now, it's your money. And I know that's not reasonable, but I believe so passionately in what we do that I need to raise a lot of money to help a lot of families. And I just want to get you involved. And I want to understand where it is, where, where we can get you involved. And by the way, if you say no, that's okay. I'm not going to flip the table or hold my breath or pout. It's your money. And and I, I just would like you to be part of us. So I think being really honest and candid to people has really helped us. Now, that sounds like a lesson that, that you grew into realizing that the directness and the candor was going to be part of it. And I am assuming out of that conversation, was it, uh, was it successful? Was it effective? I didn't get all his money, but it was it was Well, not effective. all of it. I yeah, would. <laughs> he, not only did they become a donor, but that, that wonderful fa- family now has become a repeat donor every year, every year in and out. And not so much a donor in money, but a donor in insight and and feedback which is so valuable and committed partnership like that is is critical no matter what your industry correct now that was a successful learning experience what's a lesson you had to learn the hard way or a mistake you made or a do-over you wish you could have i will tell you probably my most awful embarrassing mistake in my life professionally I worked very, very hard to get in to see a decision maker at a large health system. And I was pretty new in my career. And I went in to see, it was, it was a woman, it was an older woman. And I went in to see her and she was very kind to see me. And she had pictures of her children uh, at the time. 
and I was unpacking my bag and I said, oh, they're beautiful children. Are they your grandchildren? Whoops. Yep. And she stopped and she looked at me and I just felt the room change. And she said, <laughs> my kids. And I, I, I stopped what I was doing. I said, I am so very sorry. I packed up my stuff. I said, thank you for the time. I'll never bother you again. And out I went. And I, and I learned that not to assume, not to trust your eyes, but to be really open in your questioning to get what other people want to talk about and where they're coming from. And what, now we've all had those foot and mouth moments. If you could go back and do it again, aside from changing the original question that you asked, if you had originally asked that same question, how would you have handled it as opposed, was, what alternative would there be as opposed to just w- turning around and walking away? Oh, you mean if I had made the mistake, what would I? Yeah, if you could only go back halfway, is, uh, what would you, how would you salvage that? I would probably... Because we all have those moments, right? Yeah. We all stick our foot in our mouth at some point. I would love as the communications person to pretend that it doesn't happen, but yeah. that we all have those moments where in our head something sounds great and then it comes out of our mouth and we go, wow, that sounded much better in my head. Uh, so yeah. when you can't take it back, what do you do? I think I would have owned it. I would, I would have said that's the dumbest comment I assure you that I've ever made in my life. And I would have just owned it, apologized and asked her what she would like to do. I would say, you know, I, that was the dumbest comment. I obviously did not think before I opened my big fat mouth. And <laughs> uh, you can throw me out of here and you would have every right to do so, or you will accept my apology either way. And I would like to continue the meeting. That's probably what I, what I, a more mature me would have done. But again, the more mature me would have probably hopefully never got there in the first place. But like you said, I, I have those foot and mouth instances on a weekly basis. Just ask my family. <laughs> Our families are the ones who will certainly let you know when you have them. That's for Correct. sure. Yeah. So they're, they're useful that way. No filter whatsoever. <laughs> then given where you're taking this organization, what's the next big goal for you? And what kind of communication skills do you think you'll need to further develop to reach that goal? So the goal that I have for the organization is to double in five years. We're a $2.3 million organization and I want to be $5 million. Uh, and then I, I want us to be endowed with five million, and I I want us to be in a much more sustainable place. Uh, the communication piece that I probably need to get better at is my public speaking, and I'm very comfortable. I enjoy it. It's a challenge for me, uh, and it's something I'm very um, passionate about because it gives me the opportunity to really talk about our organization and the team and the work that we do. I need to be more organized and more purposeful in my uh, public speaking and in asking for things a a better, clearer way. Does that make sense? Sure. Absolutely. That's that's what I need. Yeah. I think it's a, it's an area that everybody stands to to work on and I, I do it for a living, but at the same time, I'm always looking to polish even further. That's, that's a, a critical lens to have. Now, all of that, Brings us up to my 24 hour listening, uh, or excuse me, my listener 24 hour influence challenge. So, the challenge of the day is something that you have an opportunity to invite our listeners to participate in, where they can take one step within 24 hours to help them have greater influence in some area of their lives. How would you like to challenge our listeners today? I've been thinking about this. Um, I would like to challenge everyone to be completely clear and transparent and honest in their communication about what they want. To make a direct ask. To make a direct ask or a direct impact, whether it's at home with your, your, your significant other, your kids, your roommate, people at work. You know, if you want someone to wash their dishes in a break room, say, hey, I really want this to be a great break room. Do you mind cleaning up after yourself? Now, not to be jerky about it, you know, sure. not to make it, you know, abrasive, but just to be honest, be candid. I, I have a theory that everybody wants honesty in their life till it's something they don't want to hear about it. <laughs> and then it gets dicey. But if you're honest with everybody and you're honest with yourself and all, all the people you come in contact with, and you can make that a habit, life becomes much simpler. Yes. At least it has for me. Sure. Okay, so I, you, everybody out there, you've got your 24-hour influence challenge to be transparent. And remember, transparency does not have to mean sledgehammer. It does not have to mean tactless. It, that transparency, when mixed with diplomacy, 
is definitely going to be your best friend. So take that step, figure out how to approach somebody tactfully, but still be clear and transparent in what your ask is. Go and you make that You said that, that ask. much nicer than I did. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one who came up with the idea. That's critical. My job is to translate and we're all good. So from there then, we've talked about your trajectory. Now that you're leading this organization, let's talk a little, a little bit about what you look for in others who are working for you. When you're thinking about one of the concepts that I regularly get asked about in my training and my coaching is, is the concept of executive presence, leadership presence, command presence, it's got a lot of different names. How would you define that and how would you evaluate it in others? Well, the way that I look at it and the way that I try to bring it into our meetings is when you come in, you have to be comfortable with yourself and confident with yourself. That means that doesn't mean you think you're the greatest thing on the planet. It means that you know who you are, you know your challenges, you know your positives, and you come in, you own it, and you come in, and you just are, and you're fully present. I think you have to be fully present. I think you have to come in with a purpose. And I like to see people that come in and, 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 and feel the room out and go in. And I'm guessing you're talking about in a crowded room or a board room. It doesn't have to be. It, it can be matter. one-on-one because you need to show up and talk to the, whoever it happens to be. But they need to feel that. That executive presence is kind of that X factor, right? The, yeah. the how do people – because you can be the boss and not be recognized as a leader. Or you can be an intern in the mailroom and have somebody go, wow, that kid's really going to be something. So – and I think you need to, um, this is going to sound very elementary, but be on time and be groomed. You don't have to be in a three-piece suit, but you have to have yourself together. And I think that you have to come in looking to add value. I think it's really important. It's worked really well for us. We're here. This is the meeting we're in. This is the setting that we have. How can we bring value to those that are here? And I think that that helps. Nice then when you're looking to groom someone from, from within and you're uh, trying to get them ready for greater opportunity, for greater responsibility, representing your company, what would you say are the three most important communication skills that you're looking for when, when you're promoting or from hiring, if you're going to hire somebody else to represent? What do you look for? I, I look for uh, people that come in and have done their research communicate that to me. They communicate good questions to me. Um, and they're honest. I, I, I think one of the most freeing moments of my life is when a boss of mine pulled me aside early in my career and says, I don't expect you to know everything. If you don't know, say you don't know, it's okay. And I'm still doing that today. There's at least several times a week where I'm like, you know what, I'm not exactly sure about that. This is what I think it is, but let me follow up with you and then get right back and actually follow up. Sure. Those, that's what I really look for for people. So as far as the honesty is concerned in that moment, you're looking for them to, to be ready to admit what they don't mm -hmm. know as of yet. Okay. Yep. So then what would be a red flag that would be a complete derailer? The red flag for me uh, that's really built up is when people use the word I and me all the time. Mm. I actually will take the time to start counting the words I and me. When people come in to talk to us and when we as a team sit down, if there's someone that, you know, I did this and I did that, let me tell you about me and just time out. Just, yeah. let's, let's talk about how you, how you work in a team. Right. It's just critical. Yeah. Now then when those people individually, collectively or otherwise need to report back up to you, that managing up issue, mm -hmm. What do you wish more of your employees would do or stop doing for that matter? So one of my favorite scenes and one of my favorite movies is The Godfather when uh, the attorney, the conciliary is talking to the movie producer and he says, the guy's not going to give him his way. So the attorney stands up, says, thank you for a lovely meal. If your car could take me back to the airport, my, I work for a man who wants to know bad news immediately and in person. I'm, I'm that way. Tell me the bad news right away. No blame. We'll figure all that out down the road. What happened? What's the bad news? And then come to me with a solution. I don't, my job is not to 
be a dumping ground for anyone's problems. Nobody's job is. But I love being collaborative. So if there's a mistake that was made or if there's a problem that's been had or an issue, be honest. The worse the news, the faster, the more honest I need to know. And then come to me with an idea of here's what I was thinking. And then we'll figure it out because, quite frankly, you may have a better idea about it. And we together can, can work it out. So that's what I really wish people would do more often. And, and my team is very good. I have a great team. So they, they figured that out. That's great. And hopefully that's where the Godfather analogy ends. You're not kneecapping yes. anybody with the wrong As responses. far as you know, no. <laughs> I've always said I'm Italian. You know, we never get our hands. We have people for that. So I would <laughs> never do anything that terrible. We know a guy. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So this, Paul, this brings us to our speed round. So these are some of the most common themes and challenges that I hear in my work on a regular basis. And what I find is that so many people feel like they're the only ones struggling with these different issues or who are frustrated or, or wondering about these kinds of topics. So just real quick, where do you stand on each of these topics? And then I'll ask a quick little follow-up piece of advice from you on okay. each of them. So now, the first one is, is of course, about public speaking. And most people feel like they love it or hate it. Now, you've mentioned already that you love it. So with that, can you give people who perhaps don't love it so much one tip for managing nerves and speaking with confidence? So I do love it. Uh, managing nerves is everybody's nervous. No matter who they are, no matter how good they are, everybody's nervous. Use that nervousness, that energy as gasoline for the tank and help that to carry you. And the one trick that's worked for, for us is find something to enjoy about it. Is your friend in the audience? Is it a friendly audience? Do you want to say something that you've never said before? Do you want to try something different? Those are, those are fun things and, and have made it more interesting for us. With that, now you, is there a correlation? You are a good public speaker. You enjoy it. Would you consider yourself to be an introvert or an extrovert? Extrovert, yeah. Okay. And as a result of that extroversion, what is one strength that comes with the territory? And what's one area that you realize you need to work on as a result of it? I think this, the, the, the positive about it is uh, extroverts, for the most point, are, are pretty comfortable in new situations. So you have an opportunity to walk into a new situation and really enjoy it more than somebody else who might be a little bit more, you know, kind of, to your word, a little bit more nervous about it. We're less nervous. We just are there to have a good time and bring value and meet more people. And my wife's in the, in the like most couples, my wife's in the other room. She's probably going to laugh at this, but I need to learn how to shut up and listen <laughs> a little bit better. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm trying. But, you know, extroverts tend to be out there. So I'm trying to stay a little bit quieter. Working on the listening half of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm right in there with you. So with that, then, you mentioned challenges as far as dynamics with significant others, with teammates, with whoever else. When those little conflicts occur, what is your natural instinct to respond, whether you have to, are the one who has to initiate the difficult conversation or if it comes at you, is your instinct fight, flight, freeze, or something else? And then how do you have to work on that as a result? Yeah, that, I really like that question, by the way. Uh, my first instinct is to fight, but not brawl. My instinct is to, well, let's figure it out. Let's talk about it. Help me understand where you are, why this happened, how you were thinking, why did it happen this way? I, I just had a situation with an employee, and this employee did something, and I didn't like it but I didn't understand it. And I got a little, my back up a little bit. And I called one of my team and I'm like, do me a favor, talk me down a little bit. Cause I'm, this is what I'm feeling. And then they gave me a little background and I sat on it for a day. And I said, and then I saw where this employee was, what goal she was trying to achieve. And she did a great job. And I told her, I said, I gotta be honest with you. When that happened, I didn't like it. And I was ready to call and not rip you, but have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And you were right. 
I was completely wrong. And I didn't understand where you were coming from. And you pushed the envelope in a good way and made us better. And now we'll do that, that particular job a little differently because of you and I really appreciate it. That's terrific. So, so I think for me, I know I can be a blockhead and I know that I get, my emotions can get up there. So having true self-awareness or trying to, and then thinking about the other person coming and maybe bringing in a third, this passionate third party to say, Hey, here's where I'm coming from. Help me with this. So. That's a really great example of, of a skill that uh, Brene Brown talks about. If you're familiar with her mm -hmm. work at, at just one of the trigger sentences that she acknowledged and, and you paraphrase it of sorts is the ability of a leader to look and say, you know what the story in my head is in recognizing here's how I'm feeling. And it's because I'm interpreting, I'm guessing, I'm filling in these blanks based on what I'm assuming with regard to your motivations and your efforts or something like that. So help me figure out what the story in my head is more fiction than fact of sorts. And yeah, it sounds it, like you did a great job of that. Well, I did a bad job of getting wound up initially. And I think the other thing is to, to assume no malice. Right. You know, 99% of the people in the world aren't getting out of bed today to irritate you or me or us. <laughs> they, they're not. And, you know, the person that cuts you off in traffic or takes your parking spot, it's just give them the benefit of the doubt that maybe they didn't realize that's what they were doing. Right. So. Right. Right. There are a few who just, you really have there a hard time a understanding what else there, but for the most part, benefit of the doubt, benefit of the doubt is warranted. So Paul, now tell me, how can people learn more about you and bringing hope home? So people can go on our website, bringinghopehome.org, bringinghopehome.org. Uh, and they can also follow us on social media, BHH Philly on Instagram at BHH nation on Twitter and on Facebook. And if they uh, have a family that is in need go through their social worker uh, and we'll work with that family. They're nominated by the social worker at the hospitals, all families, all types of people, all types of cancer. We're in uh, six states, PA, Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and uh, New York and Connecticut. And we just want to help families. So bringing hope home.org. That's terrific. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Is there any final thoughts you'd like to offer with the audience? Well, thank you, Laura. And I would just have uh, people be candid, be transparent, and enjoy their day. Life's short. What a beautiful way to end our interview today. Thank you again for joining us. And thank you, everybody at home, for tuning in and listening. And remember, if you want to download my quick start guide to mastering the three C's, command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you are listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. See you again. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for readers who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.